Hey guys, Michael Corlum here, and I'm back with an analytical playthrough of Ultima 2 Revenge of the Enchantress. I'll be comparing it to the first game in this series. Watching my video on Ultima 1 isn't necessary, but if you're interested, I'll put a link to that in the video notes. If you enjoy this kind of content, let me know in the comments and share the video around. I'm looking for work as a narrative designer and game writer, so the more eyes I get on my channel, the better my chances. This is going to be an informative playthrough with a focus on the game's design and the experience of playing it. I'll be skimming over the grinding, and Ultima 2 has a lot of grinding. There are also large areas of the game world where nothing of importance has been implemented, and I won't be bothering to visit those parts, as that would require yet more grinding. I'll be playing through the version available on GOG.com, which runs through DOSBox. This is your best bet if you want to pick up a copy, though it was also released for the Apple II, Atari's ST, C64, Macintosh, and a few different Japanese computers. Ultima 1 had done well enough, inspiring Richard Garriott to drop out of school to focus on his game production entirely. He also took the time to learn assembly, moving away from Apple Basic. His big inspiration this time around is the Terry Gilliam movie Time Bandits, from which he lifts the notion of time gates and traveling to a mythical time of legends to defeat the final boss. He links this to his big hit Ultima by saying that Minax, the titular enchantress, is the protege and lover of the first game's boss Mundane. The second major element he takes from Time Bandits is the cloth map showing the location of the time gates. He was so adamant about including this as part of the game that he went with the only company willing to produce it, Sierra Online. We're also provided with the game's backstory in the manual that comes with the game. This tells us a lot more than Ultima 1's manual did. We learn that the darkness arose once again following the defeat of Mundane under the auspice of Minax, the Enchantress of Evil, an apprentice of the evil wizard who grew to eclipse his power. She manipulated civilizations to an apocalyptic war in 2111, the survivors spreading through history through time doors. To return the timeline to its proper state, you need to find and eliminate her. The game offers a zero explanation as to why the setting shifts from the fictional Sosaria to Earth between games, with the manual even claiming that it was Earth that the evil wizard was plaguing in the first game. The truth is simply that Richard Gary didn't feel like time travel elements would be as effective in a world the players didn't have context for. He decided to use Earth instead. Well, sort of. The general physical layout of the continents is similar. This is eventually retconned into Minax seeking revenge against you specifically for having killed Mundane, and in Ultima 3 we're back to Cesaria again. The takeaway here is that while Garriott did want the games linked, for the first three at least, there wasn't much of an attempt at consistency. But back in this era, player expectations generally weren't high, and this was probably a good deal more ever than they'd seen in earlier RPGs like those on the Play-Doh Network or the Apshai Trilogy. We're also given a map of the galaxy, by which the game means solar system, providing us with XYZ coordinates of the known stellar bodies. This gives us the foreshadowing that, once again, we'll be heading off into space. Okay, on to character creation. Our stats are very D&D derived, though they function differently than they did in Ultima 1. Strength now dictates which armors we can wear. There was a bug in the initial Apple II release, you could never raise strength, so you'd have wanted to take it as a high level right off the bat. Agility tells us which weapons we can wield, and also, along with strength, determines what we hit. Armor functions like armor does in D&D by making us harder to hit, but stamina reduces how much damage we take when we are hit. Charisma and Intelligence together determine what kind of shop discounts we get. If the combined value is 40, we get a 38% discount. If we reach 86, that goes up to 62%. But if they reach 160, then prices skyrocket to 400%. I'm not sure if this is intentional or a bug, but it's probably the latter. Gold is pretty scarce in the game, and we're going to be doing a lot of grinding for it, so saving money is our biggest concern here. Wisdom covers our chance to cast spells. Note, however, that these spells are only useful in Dungeons and Towers, both of which are entirely optional and honestly a bit useless in Ultima 2. We'll dip in during this playthrough to show them off a bit, but there's nothing mission critical inside, and they serve far less of a purpose than grinding than they did in Ultima 1. For our character, we're going to go with a 16 in Strength, 29 in Agility, 10 in Stamina, Charisma, and Wisdom, and a 15 in Intelligence, because each of these scores will be modified by our choice of race, gender, and type. 
and a bit of 80s gender essentialism, playing a male character gives us a plus 5 to strength, and a female gets plus 10 to charisma. Saving money is a bigger deal than doing damage, at least in the beginning, so female characters are objectively a stronger option. So let's do that, giving us the plus 10 to our charisma. Next we have race. Elves get agility, dwarves get strength, humans intelligence, and hobbits wisdom. We go human, bringing our intelligence up to 20, helping us hit that 38% shop discount. Note that there's no selling anything in Ultima, too. The only source of gold is fighting, and all enemies give a pretty paltry range of treasure. There are also chests and dungeons, but they're kind of dangerous for the reward offered. Finally, we have type or class. As in the first game, they give us stat bonuses. Additionally, wizards and cleric each get their own list of spells, and fighters and thieves can't cast anything this time around. Since spells only function in dungeons, and we're not going to visit them more than once, we're going to go fighter, because the bonus of strength to 15 compared to the other type's bonus of 10. The last thing we need is a name, and we're going to go with what the later games used to depict the protagonist of the first three games, The Stranger. And here we are. As in the first game, we're dropped into the middle of a vast landscape, only this time we don't have any weapons or armor, and there aren't any points of interest to offer guidance. The tile map is the same as it was in Ultima 1, but it feels a little more compact, and it is. We have four different historical eras to visit, along with a solar system's worth of planets, so taken together, it is a much bigger world. And like the first game, we need to eat food constantly or starve to death. The good news here is that we only have to eat one unit every six steps, not every other. Unlike the first game, this rate is not reduced in dungeons or towns, making the dungeons even less useful for grinding. Horses will help us outrun our foes, but actually increase our food consumption, so we're not going to get anything in this run-through. The only mitigators are ships, which you won't see for a while. Hits, gold, and experience points are much the same as in the first game, but with a few important changes. First, the only source of gaining more hit points is by giving gold to a king. This isn't just healing, we can pay for thousands of hits, and we'll end up having to. We can't dip into dungeons and fight a few monsters for more hit points like we did in the first game, which make gold much more vital as it fuels both food and hits, and dungeons, again, even less relevant. Speaking of less relevant, experience does nothing. You have levels, but they don't give you anything, and unlike the first game, they don't gatekeep anything. So they, we can pretty much just ignore that. Our first goal is to find a place to buy weapons, armor, and more food before we run out or get killed by monsters. Without any real context as to our location or the time period, we just start moving to get a field for the landmass, keenly aware of how vulnerable we are. Thankfully, monsters are very sparse in the game, which makes grinding far more of a chore later on, but it makes our run to safety trivial. If you know where to go, you can make it all the way without even seeing a monster, and to be honest, there's not a lot of space in this continent to get lost in. And if you do run into one, well, their pathfinding is pretty easy to trick into getting them stuck somewhere. Learning to do this effectively is vital for the endgame. We find Town Linda across the channel from Lord British's castle. One of the big improvements in Ultima 2 is that the towns are now scrolling maps of their own with a distinct looking character. And speaking of characters, the NPCs now have something to say if you talk to them. The ones that move around are generic character types, like fools and fighters and thieves and merchants with a single line to share per type. The static ones, aside from the guards, get a line of flavor text or important clues. These responses don't change throughout the game, but it is a big step up for the genre, and the clue-bearing NPCs set up a precedent that'll echo down throughout CRPG history. The core loop of visiting a place, talking to everyone, then following up on the clues leading to, to monsters or dungeons or the next clue in a chain. This isn't fully present in Ultima 2, there's only a single linear quest chain and it's not very focused, but this is as foundational as the tile maps were in Ultima 1. Anyway, we equip ourselves with a sword, chain mail, and head out of town. We can't reach Britain without a ship, so we're heading to the other town of the area, Leicester, down in Africa. And that's all there is in this time period, two towns and a castle. It feels empty, uh, desolate. We can say that this works as an atmospheric timeline racked by a chronic war, but honestly it feels like Richard Garriott ran out of time. We'll see a few more echoes of a grander plan that were never implemented as we play. In Leicester, one of our static NPCs, the chaste nubile nymph, gives us our first clue. Visit the Hotel California. 
It doesn't mean much to us yet, but taken together with a later guy who will tell us to give gold to the clerk, it'll give us some vital gameplay options later on. For now, though, we're going to stop by the magic shop for a little fourth-way wall-breaking humor. Andy Greenberg and Robert Woodhead were the forces behind the rival CRPG series Wizardry. This is, I guess, the microcomputer equivalent of a disc track. There are a lot of little goofy in-jokes in the flavor text, going along with Garriott's rule of cool design philosophy. He was a computer gamer, so he stuffed the game full of things he felt other gamers would think were neat, and that was pretty much as developed as game design was back in 1982. What we're really here for, though, is food, so we're going to buy some. This should be able to last us for a long while. And now it's time to grind. Most of this game is going to be grinding. We're going to need, over the course of the game, tens of thousands of gold, and each creature will give us an average of ten, regardless of difficulty. There is no easier way, there's no way around it unless you're into hex editing save files, it's just a grueling slog. First, though, we're going to grind enough to buy some better armor, and for that we're going to need about a thousand. Most of the enemies on the overworld aren't too tough, and they don't get any tougher, but they don't spawn very often, so it's going to take us a while. The thieves will give us a random item when we take them out, which is the only way to farm most of what we'll need for the game. They're pretty common though, so we'll probably have what we need just when we need it, just by the process of grinding gold. Alright, I've killed about a hundred monsters to get enough gold for reflect armor. The monsters will hit a lot less often now, which is good because we can't yet get across the water to pay Lord British for more hit points. For that, we'll need a ship. There's only one way to get ships in this time period. Steal them from pirates. Vehicles in Ultima 2 require items to operate, and for ships it's a blue tassel. We've already got a few from thieves while we were grinding, so no problem there. However, ships spawn rarely. Very rarely. So I'm prepared to spend another 10 minutes to half an hour wandering around until one shows up. Once we have one, we can continue grinding from the sea, and our ship's cannons are one of the best weapons in the game. Alright, we've got a ship. We can sail around to the British Isles and visit the castle of Lord British. This is our primary means of earning more hit points. For every 50 gold we give him, he'll give us 300 hits. We're going to go ahead and stock up as much as possible for now with all of the gold we earned grinding for that ship. While we're here, we're also going to pick up our first real clues over in the chapel. Bishop Bob directs us to Brother Antos. And Brother Antos tells us to search the stars for his kin. That is as direct as the game is going to get. We're not told that this will help us with Minax, or even directly that it's a quest instead of flavor text. In fact, none of the game's NPCs mention Minax or your quest to defeat her and fix the timeline. The next step is going to be heading off to the far-off future of 1990 through the Timegate. However, there's a problem. We 
can't bring our ship with us. Time gates only appear on land, so we're gonna need a new ship on the other side, which means grinding for another one. Before we go, we're gonna make sure we have enough food and gold to last us throughout the grinding, grinding process. So that's what's next. Uh, fortunately, our ship makes this easier, we don't eat while we're in the ship, and our cannons are one of the most powerful weapons in the game. Alright, a uh, hundred or so enemies later, and we're ready to go, leaping through the Western Europe Time Gate. This brings us to 1990, right in front of Lord British's castle again. Only in the future! It's almost exactly the same. Time travel is cosmetic. The same creatures inhabit each era, in the same mix of medieval and future technologies, wherever you go. The towns are different at least, and the landmass does change slightly, but the gameplay is exactly the same. This only makes narrative sense if you squint hard and assume that after Minax caused the apocalypse, the effects rippled backwards through time, and the only survivors are those from the future who fled through the time gates. In reality though, this is just another symptom of the game's rushed release. With more time, Gary could have given us more towns per era, differences of enemies, and different shops in different times. Uh, I don't entirely blame uh, online systems, later Sierra Online. Uh, I think Richard really had a problem with scope here, but we'll get into that when we get to the conclusion. Brother Antus somehow also exists in 1990. Has he been here since 1423 BC, over 2,000 years, or is he also traveling through time? We don't know. Uh, he does clarify that we're looking specifically for his father. After a quick trip to the nearby Port Boniface for food, we take the time gate back to 1423 BC. Not all time gates are two-way. Some are one-way, and some will take you somewhere else when you try to head back through them. We're headed to one of those now. We take a short trip to South America and wait around for the gate. It shows up, we jump through, and we're in the dark shattered future of 2112, which looks exactly like every other era for the most part. We're not here for long though because we can't go anywhere from this landmass. There's nothing to do except wait for the time gate to return unless we want to grind for yet another pirate ship, and no, no thanks. The time gate appears and we're back in South America, only this time 1990, and now it is time to grind for a ship. This will take as long as it did in 1493 BC, though we have a good store of food and hits to keep us for the duration. Alright, we got another ship. We're not going to sail off anywhere far yet, we've got a little more prep to do, first by visiting New San Antonio. It's the first settlement we've seen with a more modern design. The tiles are all the same, but the layout is more like a modern city. And the city here is home to the prestigious Hotel California. Yeah, like the song, Rule of Cool strikes again, and our very first clue was to visit. Talking to the clerk here is the only way in the game to increase our stats. There's a good chance a random stat goes up by 4 each time we give him 100 gold. The trick is, though, there's a major bug in Ultima 2. If we raise a stat above 99, it rolls around to 0. Likewise, if we get more than 99 of any item, it'll revert to zero. 
and health, food, and gold all roll around at 9999 So does experience, but it doesn't really matter. This is easy to avoid. For instance, we don't want to raise any stat above 96, and because prices jump after charisma and intelligence get above 160, we want to stop at a combined of 156 to give us that four-point margin. This is the game's major grind fest, and it's going to take a lot of doing. Since enemies give so little gold, again, 10 gold pieces per foe regardless of difficulty, it's going to take something like 20,000 gold to max ourselves out. That's literally 2,000 enemies at the same plotting rate we've been progressing. This is honestly the worst part of the game, and it's also the bulk of the game. There is, again, no way around this. It's going to take me a few days of real time to make this happen, unless I marathon it in one, which I'm not going to do, so we're going to make this playthrough a two-parter. The next Ultimate 2 video will be up in a few days, so subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so it doesn't pass you by.